Well, it sure is good to be here with people. I came over at 9.30 this morning to hear Chris preach, <laughs> and nobody was here. And so the first thing that occurred to me is exactly what would have occurred to you. I said to myself, we Adventists have been wrong all along. <laughs> the secret rapture is a correct doctrine, <laughs> and I've been left behind. So I just wandered around in the building by myself, and then I thought, well, maybe they relocated somewhere. So I wandered around outside, and, and it dawned on me that something's wrong. So I tried to text somebody, but we're here, and you can't text anybody. <laughs> it just doesn't work. So uh, after a few minutes, I encountered someone, and they said, no, there's no meeting. Everybody's out at the lake but you. So tonight, we're going to spend our time together exploring something that is extremely important for me. I hope it proves to be as important for you. I want you to know ahead of time that we're going to be exploring something that is going to exert an influence, hopefully, that will make us a little bit more vulnerable than we're accustomed to being. So I'm just giving you a warning ahead of time. Uh, we've been speaking a lot to our heads here intentionally each evening, and uh, tonight uh, I want to see if we can't inch our way into our hearts. So let's pray together one more time. Father in heaven, we want to hear you not only in our intellects but also in our emotions. Father, please say things to us that, that we need to hear from you so that we can feel things more deeply, perhaps, than we ever have before. I pray that, that the promise of the new covenant would be ours tonight, that you would give us hearts of flesh in place of hearts of stone, that we would become more sensitive, that we would feel your feelings tonight, in Jesus' name. Amen. So a number of years ago, I was doing a series of meetings um, very much in a facility like this, and uh, there was a center aisle just like this, and seats to the left and to the right, and night one, as I stood up to speak, I, I noticed that it was, of course, all adults and just one little girl to my left right here. I thought, wow, you know, there are children's meetings, I wonder why she's here, and I thought she's going to be bored silly, and I was kind of feeling bad for her, but I just proceeded to go ahead and give the message, and I thought, she'll just sit there and color and, and eat Cheerios or Wheat Bix or something, you know, she'll be fine. So I finished giving the message, and her mother came with the little girl and introduced her. She said she was four years old and, and uh, told me her name. Her name was Megan. I made the mistake of calling her Megan, and she corrected me with a finger in my face. It's Megan, not Megan. So I got that cleared up, and I thought, wow, she has just the kind of personality that I love. I hope she keeps coming, and her mother informed me that she was going to be coming to all the adult meetings, and this was going to be for two weeks, every night. And I thought, nah, she won't last. But there she was, every night, and I thought, she's not tracking with me, she's not paying attention, she's probably coloring or something. And I saw each night that she was doing something on her lap with a piece of paper and some crayons, so I thought, oh, she's fine. Her mother came to me another night and said, I've talked to Megan, I've told her there are children's meetings, I've, I've said, Megan, you need to go to the little kid meetings. And, but she told me, she said, Mommy, I know I'm a little kid, but I like that man. <laughs> And I said, oh, that's cool. Well, Megan, I like you too. And I thought, there's no way that she's going to understand, but just tolerate the child. And as she was there each evening, there were a few times when I thought, you know what? It seems to me like she's tracking. She would look at me at different times and kind of nod her head like, I get it. And I thought, no, she's four years old. She doesn't get it. She's just playing with me because she's a little mischievous. And I thought, okay, a relationship is developing here. Well, 
Two weeks of meetings went by, and at the final meeting, uh, everything was closing down, so lights were going off, and people were packing up, and I was getting my computer and all of my gear together and putting it in my bag, and, and here comes little Megan from the back up the center aisle with her mom behind her, kind of coaching her along, and I could see as she's approaching that she has a piece of paper in her hands. And as she comes up to me and I come down the stairs, she looks up into my face with that piece of paper, and I'm trying to see what it is, and I'm focusing on her because it seems like she has a message for me. And she looks up and she says, Mr. Ty, Mr. Ty, I, I, and I thought, man, she's really feeling this. She said, Mr. Ty, I love you. I mean, I really love you. I love you with all my, and she forgot the rehearsed word. <laughs> I love you with all my tummy, and she rubbed her tummy. <laughs> And her mom from behind said, Megan, your heart. <laughs> Mr. Ty, correction. <laughs> that would be with all my heart that I love you. And I said, Megan, I love you too. Thank you. And she said, I have something for you. I said, is it that? Is it that piece of, yeah, it's for you. And she put this piece of paper in my hands, and I found myself looking at the most beautiful piece of art I've ever seen in my life. And I've been to the Louvre in Paris with my wife. She forced me to march through that thing for four <laughs> days straight, looking at everything from the Mona Lisa to a bunch of other stuff. And I'm telling you, this was better. And I'm looking at this piece of paper, and I say, thank you, Megan, I really appreciate this. And she says, Mr. Ty, do you see it? I said, yeah, I see it. I, yep, right here, I see it. No, Mr. Ty, look, do you really see it? I look a little more carefully. I said, yeah, I see it. Thank you. She said, Mr. Ty, I don't think you see it. <laughs> so I'm examining the picture, and I see a beautiful blue sky that she's made, and I see birds in the sky, and I see sunshine all yellow and bright shining down, and I see that there is land in front of the water, and I see that there are two people walking along the water, there on the land, and, and I'm looking, and she says, do you see it? I said, yeah, there's some people, and they're walking. She said, Mr. Ty, there's a big person and a little person. I said, yes. She said, you're the big person, and I'm the little one. <laughs> I said, oh, wow, that looks just like me. <laughs> and she said, but look, Mr. Ty, because we're holding hands. <laughs> and sure enough, I looked, and there we were, Megan and Ty walking along the water holding hands. And then the punchline. She said, Mr. Ty, do you know why we're holding hands? And I said, why? She said, because we like each other. I thought, you're my favorite person in the world right now, and I like you very, very much, Megan. It's one of the best gifts I've ever received in my whole life. Now, I have a question for you, and it's a deep question that I think we need to explore. Megan made a statement. She said, I love you with all my heart. Now, my question is this. Did she? Could she? I mean, she has a mom. She apparently loves her mother. She has a dad. She loves her dad. If I put the pieces together correctly, she also had a brother. So how could she love me with all her heart and at the same time love them? The question I'm asking is one that I want to explore with you in such a way that we're going to look at two things for the note takers. We're going to explore both the enormity and the intimacy of God's love. The enormity and the intimacy of God's love. Now, what I'm going to be suggesting to you is that it is, in fact, possible for one person to love 
more than one person with all their heart. And this is going to hopefully open up to us an understanding of, listen carefully, the nature of love. And once we wrap our minds around the nature of love and we, we get it, we realize, oh, that's what it is. That's what love, that's how love works. Then we're going to pan out and we're going to apply what we've discovered to our understanding of God's love. So first of all, let's look at the most familiar Bible verse in all of Scripture. John 3.16, most people who have had any exposure to the Bible at all know this verse. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. Now, look at the screen carefully because I'm going to emphasize two parts of the text now. All right? There is in the text the world. And then there is in the text the whosoever. There is, on the one hand, the big idea of God's love for all, but there is also the extremely personal idea of God's love for each. God's love for all, God's love for each. Does God love everybody in some kind of general sense? Well, yes, God does, according to this text. But don't let the big idea of God's love for everybody crowd out of your mind the very intimate idea of God's love for you personally. Now, for those of you who are familiar with the writings of Ellen White, you'll find this in the book Steps to Christ, page 100. She taps into this concept with this fabulous insight. The relations between God and each soul are as full as, as distinct and full as though there were not another soul upon the earth, as though, track with this language, as though there were not another soul upon the earth to share his watch care, not another soul for whom he gave his beloved son. Can we just let that register for a minute? God's love is of such a nature that there is a very real sense in which you are alone in the universe with God. Now, we understand how this works even on our finite human plane. We understand how this works. Have you ever been alone with someone in a crowd? There could be hundreds of people in a mall, for example, or a grocery store, but you're hyper-conscious of your little boy, your little girl. And if they're out of sight for just two seconds, your heart starts to pound and you must locate them. Are you tracking with me? So there are people all around you. You're with all of those people, but at the same moment that you are in the crowd, you're alone, in a sense, with this one individual. I've experienced this over and over again throughout the years because I'm often in a setting like this where I'm preaching or teaching and there are a lot of people and, and you know, from my standpoint, you just look like a bunch of human faces right now. I mean, there are a few people out there I know, you're familiar faces. But oftentimes, most of the time, my wife travels with me and, and I'll stand up and instinctively, I don't even think about it, I just locate her, I don't, oh, okay, I've got it. I know where she is. For some reason, I want to kind of tune in to her for just a split second, just long enough to know, okay, she's here and there she is. And so there's the sense in which there's a telepathic connection of sorts between her and I. I'll just locate her. I got to look away quick though, because if I keep looking, I'll get distracted. She'll wink at me or something and and then I'll have to say to her with my eyes without words, girl, I'm about to preach, stop it. <laughs> so here we are with hundreds of people and then she's trying to flirt with me. I'm like, stop it. And then I just have to focus on the word of God. But here we are, a crowd of people, and I can guarantee you that there are people in this room right now who are in the crowd and simultaneously hyper-conscious of one other. That's happening right now in this room. 
Okay, so what, what we're getting at here is that love is of such a nature that it is possible to have a kind of general kind of love for a bunch of people, whether you even know them or not. I mean, I could say to you right now, I love all of you in a, in a Christian sense, in a principled sense. Most of you, I don't know you, but, but I, I kind of, I guess, love you in a sense, right? But now, think about this for a minute. If, if, if we as finite human beings can love like that in a kind of, you know, broad general sense, but then in a very specific sense, right? This helps make sense out of a profound statement by C.S. Lewis when he says of the death of Jesus, he's actually commenting on John 3.16, he, Jesus, died not for men, but for each man. If each man had been the only man made, he would have done no less. Okay, so just let that register for a minute. Let's just imagine, hypothetically for a minute, that, that there are only you and God in existence. And that you alone have become a sinner. Would God have said, you know, it's just him, it's just her. I'll just extinguish her and start over. Or would God have said, with just you, just you and no one else in the universe, if you had been the only person to save, would God's personal history have unfolded precisely the same? Would Jesus have suffered and died for you as if there were not another person in all the universe to die for? Now, if, if you and I can say yes to that, theoretically, now we're going to try to inch our way into also emotionally apprehending the idea tonight, but if we can begin intellectually, just rationally saying, yeah, okay, that makes sense, I can see how that if God is love, that of necessity, I mean, yeah, intellectually I would have to agree with the idea that he loves me, and that if I were the only sinner to be saved, he would have died for me. Now, if you can just believe that intellectually, you are on your way to a deeply profound and meaningful existence. Because if you exist at the center of God's love, your value is not only beyond estimation, listen, not only are you valuable beyond estimation, there must be something about you that separates you from the pack of humanity that makes you so utterly unique that you are irreplaceable. Let me put it to you this way. There are certain things I mentioned the other evening that even Almighty God can't do. Do you remember that time we spent together where we pointed out that, that nonsense is still nonsense even when we speak it of God? You can't say, oh, God is so powerful, he could create two adjacent mountains with, or one, you know, <laughs> two adjacent mountains with no valley between. And we said, no, that's one mountain. God could create a square circle. No, that's, a square is a square, a circle is a circle. Okay, here's something God can't do. If you, if you were to cease to exist, it is absolutely impossible for you to be reproduced. God Almighty, with all his creative resources, could not recreate out of non-existence another you if you were to cease to exist. You have a history. You have a series of relationships that you have engaged on, in that have, you know, bit by bit, shaped you into the particular unique identity of a human being that you are. There's literally nobody else like you. And if you were to cease to exist, there never could be anyone else like you. So God doesn't just love you as a human. God loves you as precisely you. 
God loves the you that you are with all of the contours of personality and character and memories and histories and your, your, your sense of humor, your, your particular unique way of waking up each morning and what you choose for breakfast. There is a uniqueness about you that is quite literally irreplaceable even for God. Now, now, now track with me. Think this through a little bit further with me. I'm going to ask a question, and I want you to reason it through with me. Is love a divisible sum or an exponential reality? Let's think about this for a minute. So do a little exercise with me. It's going to be a little weird, but just track with me here. I want you to imagine something. Do you have an imagination? Of course you do. Now imagine that you have 10 children. Go ahead, do it. Imagine it. Go ahead. I'll leave you alone for a minute with that. Imagine that you have 10 children. Now the first question would be, of course, why did you do that to yourself? <laughs> right? But once you get over the, just the sheer shock of your predicament, there you are with 10 children. Here's the question. Here's the question. Do you love each of the 10 children with all of your love, or is it 10% for each? Do you hear the question? Now, you're, you're a finite human being. I'm a finite human being. So the illustration, it breaks down at, I don't know, about 56 children. If you have 56 children, the illustration ceases to be meaningful. You don't even know their names at that point. You don't even give them names. <laughs> you assign numbers. You don't have dinner around a table. There is no such table. You feel, fill a cattle trough full of wheat bix and put it in the backyard and send them out to eat. So at some point, the illustration breaks down. But, but don't let it break down for our purposes right now. The question is a serious one. If you had 10 children, would you love each of the 10 with all your love, or would you have to divide your love up somehow into percentages? If, let me put it to you this way, you have 10 children, let's just say by some kind of tragedy, and I don't mean to give anybody pain here, and, I, and I'm sorry if this gives you pain, but I want you to know that if you have a situation in which what I'm about to say gives you pain, well, you have a window into God's love that other people may not. So I'm sorry if this gives you pain, but let's just imagine that you have 10 children. And let's just imagine that by some tragedy, one of them was lost to life and died. What would you think if your neighbors came and said, well, you have nine others, what's the big deal? Or what if somebody came to you and said, well, apparently you are very good at having children, just have another. Do you see the callousness in that? Do you, do you sense that there's something fundamentally wrong with that? You should. What's wrong with that? You could not have 10 more children to replace the one that you lost. Would you agree with that? You could not have a thousand. You couldn't have, there, there is no number of human beings that could replace one human being. Now that's either a fact or it's not. And our earlier point that you exist as an utterly and completely and totally, unequivocally unique individual that is irreplaceable, if that is a correct premise, then you are driven to the conclusion that there is no entire population of a world that could replace one human being. Now, if you sit with that for a few minutes and you begin to believe it, it will alter the course of your life. It will change the way you see everybody around you it will alter your attitude to even the people that irritate you. Now, let's just go a step further. If what we've said so far is true, and I'm going to suggest 
to you that it is, then why is it that we as human beings live in such a way and in such a world academically and intellectually and rationally where this constantly evades us? Because if what we've said so far is true, it's apparently, I would say, one of the most astounding things the human mind could ever realize. And I'm going to suggest to you that, that what we have experienced, especially in Western culture, and all of us are Westerners, most of the world is now through media and through the entire academic process that has overtaken the world. In the book, Irrational Man by William Barrett, he makes a profound statement that I just want to work with for a moment with you. He says, Hebraism and Hellenism, pause right there so we know what we're talking about. He's essentially saying, the Hebrew way of thinking, i.e., Moses and the prophets, the Old Testament, Scripture, Jesus, the apostles, are you with me? Hebraism is the Hebrew way of thinking and processing reality. It's a lens. It's like a, a window through which you see things and make sense of reality. Hellenism is the Greek way of thinking. The Greek way of thinking. Plato, Aristotle, before them, Socrates. So the Greek way of thinking and the Hebrew way of thinking, Barrett suggests, as a philosopher, as an educator who's examining basically how it is that human beings tend to see the world, he says, between these two points of influence moves the world. The, the world moves. Everybody, he's suggesting, is either Greek in their orientation to reality or Hebrew in their orientation to reality. Everyone. Now, to be Greek in your orientation to reality looks something like this. We begin with Plato. Plato would say that what's going on in the universe at the highest level, what we call God, although oh, he didn't deal specifically with the personal God concept so much that we're familiar with, but, but the highest plane of reality, he would suggest that God is absolute. Absolute. Now, the word absolute in this technical sense, in this academic sense, in this philosophical sense, to say God is absolute is to say that all there is, is God. And all of us, this sense that we have that here I am and there you are and then there's God and we exist adjacent to one another. You're a particular you and I'm a different you. I'm a, I'm a me, you're a you. We can have a conversation. Something could happen between us where I could hurt you or I could make you happy. This idea of individual personhood. Plato would say there's no such thing as individual personhood. All there is, is God. God is absolute, and all of us, we are, a kind of, we are a kind of figment of God's narrative imagination. So, so, so it's, like, it's like a novel has been written, and you're chapter 14. And uh, God is playing with the words on the paper, so to speak, and uh, can alter the story at will. And this is where you get the idea in Greek philosophy of fatalism. You hear the word fate or destiny. This is where, you know, somebody says to me one time, my wife and I were, were paired up with some people at a table at a social event. We didn't know them, but, but uh, it was kind of a buffet style, and people could just go get food somewhere and come back and eat, and you were getting to know each other. And, and so we were getting to know this couple, and, and uh, he just kept going and getting another plate of food, and, another, and he was eating all of it. It was, it was an amazing thing to behold. <laughs> he, he just kept eating it and eating it. And then when he was done with three or four plates, whatever it was, of, of all of these calories, um, his wife commented when he left, she, she said to us, that we were just getting to know them, she said, now watch, he's going to come back with five or six desserts on one plate. He's going to eat all of it. 
And when he arrived at the table with a plate full of that stuff, she said, you're going to die. You're going to die. You're going to leave me all alone in this world. You're going to die. And he said, as a good Hellenist, he said, baby, when is my time to go? It's my time to go. Ain't nothing I can do about it. Okay, that's Plato. That's fate. We still have it woven into the English language. For example, if there's a car accident and somebody has died, we say it's a fatality. This is the idea that everything that happens is supposed to happen, or else it wouldn't have. When it's my time to go, it's my time to go. There's a, a date set, and I'll die on that date. No matter what I do with my cardiovascular system, I will die when it's my time to die. Are you still with me or am I losing you? Okay, Plato thinks this way. There is, for Plato, there is true forms and illusion. And our free will is an illusion. You don't actually exist as a freestanding agent apart from God or apart from me or you or, or, or me apart from you. We don't actually exist. So, Plato had a student, his star student, his protege, and his name was Aristotle. Aristotle took the premise of Plato that God is really all there is and everything that happens is supposed to happen. It's all fated. There's nothing you can do about anything. This is called determinism, destiny, fate. Okay, now watch where this goes. So Aristotle comes along and says, well, if what... If what my teacher Plato says is true, if God is absolute, then God is the unmoved mover. Now, certainly you've heard that term. This is the most popular term in all the history of Western philosophy. The unmoved mover idea, it's just right on the face of it, isn't it? You see what it's saying? That God is the one who moves everything external to himself. So if something happens, God made it happen. Are you still with me? Whatever. What you had for breakfast, what you had for lunch, why you all abandoned me today and left me here. What, whatever happens, it was all, God made it all happen. Okay? So God is the great mover. He moves, but he is forever what? Unmoved. Nothing moves upon God. Like if you were to be sad, God wouldn't care. It wouldn't move him. If you were happy, it wouldn't mean anything to God. Why? Why wouldn't it mean anything to God if you were happy or sad? I mean, think about it. What if your vacuum cleaner was sad? Would you be troubled? It's just a mechanical device. You control it. It's an extension of your person that you are... Con you can't be sad about the condition of your vacuum cleaner, your microwave, your toaster, your computer. It's all you. So God's the unmoved mover. So Augustine, who was a student of the works of Plato and Aristotle, converts to Christianity and brings his philosophical paganism with him. And Augustine says, well, if all that's true, if God is absolute and God is the unmoved mover, he says God is deterministic and impassable. Now that word pass that you hear in impassable is the word passion or emotions. And this is the great Western tradition called classical theism. This is the idea that God predetermines all outcomes, including who's going to be saved, who's going to be lost. Who gets cancer, who doesn't? Who gets healed from cancer, who doesn't? Are you, are you with me still? God just orchestrates everything. We're puppets on strings. He's just pulling the strings, pulling the strings, pulling the strings. You, your free will is an illusion. So John Calvin comes along later on. I mentioned this the other evening. He says, well, then if God is absolute and God is impassable, nothing impacts God emotionally. In fact, God couldn't possibly have any emotions at all. Because to be emotional is to be moved. If God is perfect, he couldn't be altered in any way emotionally. 
So Augustine comes along and he says, God predetermines all outcomes and God doesn't feel anything. He's impassable or incapable of emotions of any kind. Now, one of three things is true. I can't think of a fourth. We're either machines that are pre-programmed like a computer to produce certain results, or we're free, but we are in bondage, we're slaves, controlled by God or an external force of some kind, or we're free agents. These are, these are the three options. Now, in the great Western tradition of classical theism that has come down to us and has infected all of our thinking, we tend to abdicate ourselves from responsibility by blaming fate or destiny or sovereign God. However, we want to pigeonhole it or articulate it for ourselves in order to not have to reckon with reality. It's a kind of, it's a kind of self-medicating. It's a philosophical drug. It's a way not to feel what we would feel if we were to view ourselves in a Hebrew sense, through a Hebrew lens. Now, God we know and often speak of, Augustine would say this and Calvin would say this, and that, that God is omnipotent or all-powerful. God is omniscient, all-knowing, and God is omnipresent. He's simultaneously everywhere all the time. I'm going to ask you this evening to make a kind of intellectual um, divergence or a break from the Greek way of thinking and to incorporate a new word, a, some new vocabulary, a, a, a fourth omne. Okay, we only know these omnes. I'm going to ask you to say, huh, I'm going to incorporate a fourth omne. All of these are true. God is omnipotent. God is omniscient. God is omnipresent. I'm going to suggest to you that the Hebrew way of thinking, that is the biblical way of thinking, that is Moses, the prophets, Jesus, the apostles, that what we find in the Bible is that not only is God omnipotent, omniscient, and omnipresent, but God is omnipassionate. That God is, if you don't like the word passionate, you could say that God is omni-emotional. In other words, that God feels very deeply everything that touches you. I'm going to suggest to you that every morning when you wake up, you open your eyes and you begin to take in the light, that God's perfectly conscious of you and his eyes are on your countenance. That he knows you. He knows everything you think, everything you feel, but he doesn't just know it intellectually, he knows it empathetically. He feels everything you feel. You stretch, you come to the edge of the bed, you sit there for a split second. If you're over 40, you sit there for 20 seconds. If you're over 50, you sit there for a full 15 minutes. And then you get momentum, right? And you stand up and you start hobbling through the room with that pain in your left knee that nobody knows but you, except God knows that pain in your left knee. God knows it. And as you're standing there in your room, and you open the curtains and you see two hummingbirds in midair dancing with one another. And it's delightful to you. You're like, ah, oh, that's so beautiful. That feeling of elation, like, ah, life is sweet. I mean, except for my knee, but this is cool. That feeling of elation, God is resonant with in the Hebrew way of thinking. And as you walk away from the, the window and you depart your bedroom into the rest of the house and you see that familiar framed photo there on the table and it's your son that you haven't seen in 15 years and you don't even know where he is. And a feeling of sadness and disappointment floods your heart. In that moment, God not only knows, but feels precisely what you feel. This is the Hebrew 
way of perceiving the character of God as opposed to the Greek way of perceiving the character of God. Now, I'm going to give you an illustration. In our illustration, this is you. Do not be embarrassed by the shape of your head. Everybody has problems. Okay? We don't know why you're not smiling. Cheer up. Now, each person is represented by this face. You, me, everyone. And I'm going to suggest to you that on the human plane, on the finite plane, this is how reality operates. Okay? Every single person in this room has what I'm going to call an inner circle of intimate relationships. I'll use myself as an example. For me, there's my wife, Sue. There's my daughter, Amber. There's my son, Jason. There's my daughter, Leah. Uh, then my daughter, Amber, married a guy. I can't remember his name, but my wife says he's in my inner circle. So he's there. And that's, that's us. That's our, that's our little gig we got going on. That's, our inner, that's my inner circle, okay? So what's happening here is, watch this. I don't know if you can see this or not, but the vertical line says SQ. That's sensitivity quotient. Say that out loud, sensitivity quotient. And the NF, the horizontal, that's nearness factor. So we don't forget, say nearness factor. Okay, so, so my daughter Amber, do you see how the circle is expanding here? My daughter Amber has some friends. One of her friends' name is Melissa. I like Melissa. Melissa. Melissa's a cool girl. She hung around with my daughter Amber a lot during her high school years, and I like Melissa, okay? But listen, between my daughter Amber and I, there is a nearness factor on a scale from 1 to 10 of 10, which yields a sensitivity level of 10. Whatever Amber feels, I feel. If I look across the room and my little girl is crying, I want to know why now. If she's laughing, I'm like, tell me, I like funny things. And my family torments me because they know I like funny things. If they sometimes will laugh and I will say, what, what's funny? They'll say, we're not telling you. <laughs> and they'll, they'll let that go for hours. Sometimes I've discovered over the years that there's nothing. They're just pretending that something funny happened in order to torment me because I want to know. So it doesn't matter if my daughter Amber feels something that makes her sad or feels something that makes her happy. I feel what Amber feels. That's the nature of love. We call this empathy. Okay, but my daughter Amber has that friend Melissa. You remember her? I like Melissa, but I don't know her on the level that I know Amber. So let's just say that, that through Amber, I have a relationship with Melissa that is a, on a scale from 1 to 10, let's just call it an 8 of nearness factor that yields a sensitivity level that's pretty high because, you know, this is Amber's best friend. So I, I, I really care about Melissa, right? But my daughter Amber has a friend named Melissa who has a mom... And I think her name might be Julie, but I'm not even sure. And I have, let's say, a 5-5. Five, five. A nearness factor of 5 and a sensitivity quotient of 5 with this Julie lady that I hardly know. Okay? Now watch this. My daughter Amber has a friend named Melissa who has a mom named Julie. Are you still with me? who has a third cousin on her mother's side in the north of Ireland named Bobby McGillicuddy. <laughs> and I don't know anything about him at all and don't care. Sorry. So, I'm a finite human being. I only have so much capacity. Is there somebody here like me who has a limited capacity? You're like, I love about 10 people, and that's it. Everybody else, stay away from me. Is there anybody like that here? So you're like, okay, Amber is Amber. That's my daughter. Melissa, Julie? Or is it Judy? I don't know. Bobby McGillicuddy? If somebody came in the room not, right now and said, we just got a, a message, not that you would because you can't get any messages here, but follow the illustration. <laughs> we just got a message. Your, your daughter, Amber, is in trouble. What would I do? I mean, I'd drop this business, and I'd be out there, and I'd be on the next plane to be with Amber. If somebody came in right now and said, 
we just got a message that your daughter's friend, Melissa, is in trouble. I'd say, would you all mind just pausing with me real quick to pray for Melissa? And then I would continue with our time together. If somebody walked in and said, your daughter Amber's friend's mother's cousin, Bobby McGillicuddy, is going through something horrible in the north of Ireland, I'd say, bummer, and continue on. <laughs> because I don't know him, and I have a limited capacity. Okay, I'm not a psychopath. I just have my limits. Okay, so, now the illustration, this is the human level. We all know how this works. Now watch how this works on the divine level, right? I'm limited, I'm finite, my capacities are limited, but God has an inner circle, and I'm in God's inner circle. That's me. And then, with me, God has a nearness factor of 10, yielding a sensitivity level of 10. But my daughter Amber does not relate to God through me. She has a nearness factor with God of 10, yielding a sensitivity quotient of 10. What about Melissa? Well, Melissa's in God's inner circle. So is Julie and Bobby McGillicuddy and you and me. All of us are in God's inner circle. God has a level of capacity. His, what did we call them earlier? His omni capacities. Well, he's... He's omnipresent. So right now, God is fully present to me and fully present to Amber and Julie and Bobby and you and me. And there's no division of his capacity. And if God is omnipassionate or omni-emotional, do you see where this is going? That God feels all there is to feel. So I'm going to suggest to you from a geometric standpoint that God's love is a circle the center of which is everywhere and the circumference of which is nowhere. Do you understand what that means? That means that if right now I were to ask you, hey, everybody point right now to the center of God's love, you could literally point anywhere and be pointing in the right direction at anyone. I exist at the center of God's love because Love is not a divisible sum. It's an exponential reality. You exist at the center of God's love. So much so that scripture, the Hebrew scriptures, the what scriptures? The Hebrew scriptures portray God's character like this through the prophet Isaiah. In all their afflictions, the afflictions of the Israelites going through the wilderness, in all their afflictions, he was afflicted. That's a solidarity statement. That's a statement of empathy. That's saying that all the pain that all the Israelites experienced in the wilderness, God was simultaneously experiencing all that they were experiencing. In all their afflictions, he was afflicted. Hebrews chapter 4, verse 15 says it this way, that he is touched with the feelings of our infirmities. What? He literally feels everything that we feel. God feels all the pain of the world like you feel all the pain of all your children. Like your husband can't go through something that brings him to tears that won't bring you to tears. Unless you're kind of tired of him and you guys need counseling. But you get my point. If you feel what your husband feels then you're going to be at the center of his emotional well-being at any given moment. Or what about Psalm 56, verse 8? David is musing about God and says, you keep track of all my sorrows. Does he? I mean, you won't find Plato talking like this. You won't find Aristotle talking like this. You won't find any pagan philosopher talking like this. Only the Hebrew prophets perceive God as keeping track of everybody's sorrows. And poetically, you have collected all my tears in your bottle. You have recorded each one in your book. God is hyper-conscious and hyper-sensitive to every single thing that touches you. Ellen White in the book Desire of Ages says it this way, one of the most fabulous things you will ever read in all of literature, not just in her writings. 
Not a sigh is breathed. What's a sigh? Do you know what a sigh is? Do a sigh. What is a sigh? A sigh isn't a scream. It's not, ah! A sigh is not a very passionate expression. It is the slightest expression of discomfort. Not even a sigh is breathed. Not a pain felt. Not a grief pierces the soul. But the throb vibrates to the Father's heart. Do you believe that? Because if you begin to believe that that's the kind of God that sits on the throne of the universe, it will change everything. Jesus said it this way, in as much as you did it to the least of one of these, my brethren, you did it to me. This is solidarity language. In as much as you did it not to the least of these, my brethren, you did it not to me. In other words, anything I do, anything I do to anyone, I do to God. Just like anything you would do to my daughter Amber or my son Jason, I would take it personal. You do something to my child, you did it to me. Watch out. You can't experience anything that God is not present to the moment and to the feeling. So back to our opening text as we close. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. The word love here is the word agape, which is the word for unilateral love, unconditional love. It's not flattering, this kind of love. No, no guy wants to get a girl to marry him with purely only agape love. That would be like walking up to her and saying, listen, listen, you're not that great, but I'm amazing, so I'd like you to marry me because I have unilateral agape love. I have unconditional love. It doesn't matter anything. It doesn't matter if you, nothing about you. I'm just a great guy. Will you marry me? She's going to say, get out of here. Of course I'm not going to marry you. This is not flattering love. This is God saying, I love you regardless of anything you do to push my love away. You can't push my love away. I'll never stop loving you. This is unilateral love. This is unconditional love. This is the love of constancy and principle. This is what Ellen White in one place calls the law of love. Now track with this. Every single time in the Gospel of John that Jesus uses the word love, it's agape except one time at the end of the book, these things I have spoken to you in figurative language. I'm telling you parables and stories. But the time is coming when I will no longer speak to you in figurative language, but I will tell you plainly, just straight language, no parables, I will tell you plainly about the Father. Well, what will he tell us? In that day you will ask in my name, and I do not say that I shall pray the Father for you. Now check this out. For the Father himself loves you. And now Jesus has used the word phileo, which is friendship love, which is the love of affection. It's like the word like. In other words, God not only loves you, God likes you. God likes the you that you are. He's perfectly aware of all the pains and joys that have all converged to make the composite of you that you are. And he likes you. Now, I want you to imagine, as we close, I want you to imagine you, the you that you are, the, the very you that you are, with all the pain and the wounds and the guilt and the shame and the dysfunction all removed with all the beautiful good things about you remaining and then flowering and maturing for all eternity. It's as if the God of the universe is coming up the center aisle and he has a piece of paper in his hands and he puts it in your hands and he says, do you see it? And you look and you say, Lord, I see it. Please help me to see it. And he says, there's a big person and there's a little person. The big person is me. The little person is you. And if you look real closely, 
you'll see that we're holding hands. You know why we're holding hands, God says? Because we like each other. That's why. The message that I have for you this evening is that you are utterly unique, and God loves you, and God likes you so much that Jesus would have died for you alone if there were not another person in all the universe to save. Father in heaven, you're amazing. Thank you for loving us. Thank you for liking us. Thank you for saving us in Jesus Christ, whose, in whose name we pray. Amen.